So our series we're in is called I Never Said That, and what we've been doing is talking about things that are oftentimes misrepresented, misquoted, or misunderstood in Scripture. And we've preached a few messages so far, Steve shared last week, and this week uh, I want to take us through this message, Jesus Never Said, Be Last to Be First. And, And I might sound confusing, so let me unpack it this morning, but Jesus Never Said, Be Last to be first. And uh, if you would, in Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to begin this morning. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit at the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone more distinguished than you has also been invited? Then the host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. And then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. And Jesus never said, be last to be first. So unpacking this, I think too many times we we take Jesus' teachings on humility. And and what we do is we we misuse it as some sort of equation to do the exact opposite of the thing that Jesus is communicating. Jesus said that the last would be first. And what we hear is, so you're saying that I can be first. First. So so what you're saying is I can be first, and if I want to be first, this is how I go about it. And we use Jesus' words as an equation to actually do the opposite thing of what Jesus is communicating. He said that the last would be first, but not that you would be first for the sake of being first. We want to be noticed. We, We want to be seen. And Jesus said that the last would be first, but the way we've used Jesus' teaching misuses the point. And the, the important thing to recognize is that one of these is humility and the other is pride disguised as humility. Jesus said to be last, but our motivation is not to be first. So our, our main point today that I want to communicate is this, is, is don't be last to be first be last. Don't be last to be first, be last. One is is humility and the other is pride disguising itself as humility. We we have this way of using Jesus' teachings so that we can motivate ourselves to cashing in on the benefits of what it means to be first. And uh, it reminded me of something going on in my home right now. So my, my girls are young, and, um, you know, I don't know what your parenting style is. Um, Lindsay won't like me saying this, but I'm a big fan of bribes. Uh, I think they work very well. Um, Lindsay doesn't like to use that language. She'd say that's not what we're doing. Um, but in our home, uh, we started a, a bead system. And what this actually started as is uh, my, my little girl, Sienna, she came home from Path Church Kids, and she won, like, a jewelry homemaking kit. And it was full of all these beads. And um, I don't know if you've had a two-year-old before, but it's just the one thing a two-year-old doesn't need. Uh, These beads would be all over my house if I let her play with that. And so Lindsay came up with this creative idea. And she said, we'll start this bead system. And we'll have a jar full of beads. And then we'll have a jar for each of the girls. And and when they do something good or they're learning something, like trying to sit on the potty, and they do something well, what we'll do is we'll reward them with a bead. And what she told them is, uh, I want to give you rewards. I want to give you these beads for for doing good things. And and so, of course, um, because my kids are smart, uh, immediately they came up with a list of good things to do. And and all around the corner, what we continued to hear is, Mommy, did you see that? Did you see what I, I just did for Sequoia? And, and we would have to say, you know, um, that, that actually is not the point of what we're doing here. Um, 
You know, we want to see that you do these things out of love, out of kindness, of you just wanting to do them. Not that you would do them so that you would receive something in return for it. But all the time we're, we're fighting back this tension of did you see what I did? And, and I think this is what happens with Jesus's words about what it means to be last, that, that the last will actually be first. And what we instead hear is, so I can be first. And we motivate ourselves in ways to earn this, this highest seat of honor. And so Jesus says, hey, don't take the highest seat of honor. Actually, you should sit at the lowest place in the table. The problem is we hear the words, and then you will be honored in front of all the guests. And we go, oh, sign me up. I want to do that. I want to be promoted. I want to be exalted. Proverbs 16, 18 through 19, many of you probably know this. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Better to live humbly with the poor than to share the plunder with the proud. In Matthew 5.5, 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Grady actually mentioned this, this message this morning, is that God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. And, and what we have to ask is, in Jesus' kingdom, what does it really mean to be first? But what does this verse mean when it, it says they will inherit the earth? In some translations, it says they'll inherit the kingdom of God or they'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because earth is, is Christ's kingdom. And, and we know that, that the whole message of Jesus is actually about his kingship, that he is Lord of the earth. And one day heaven and earth will be joined together and he will take his rightful place as king over the earth. And so what Jesus is saying is, blessed are those who are humble, for they will be the ones who enter into my kingdom. They will be the ones for who spend eternity with me, who receive the lasting benefits of this kingdom that I have set before you, of this kingdom that I've prepared for you. And Luke 14, 12 through 14, I think we can see ourselves in this verse then he turned to his host and he said, when you put on a luncheon for a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the life of righteousness, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. And we begin to see the, the picture a little clearer. Is, this message is actually one of humility. Someone say humility. Motive is the test of humility. Motive is the, the test of humility. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, don't do good things for the sake of earning something in return. You do these things for these rich people, for these put-together people, for these people that in return you know you will cash back in on some reward. I instead, serve the lowest. Serve the, the orphan and the widow, the ones that, that have nothing to give you in return, the ones that have nothing for you to gain. This is what Jesus' idea of, of take the last seat really is. It's a humility that we would be motivated through humility. And if we have the wrong motive, then what we really display is pride. And they're a contrast to each other. We have pride on one side and we have humility on the other. And the problem with our culture today is we're very well set up. We're very good at disguising humility as pride. It's when we do something good, and some of you guys are on Facebook and social media, and you see these things of people giving away, doing good deeds, and then it's this selfie moment of, look at me, look at what I did. Did you see the money I gave away? I have a friend that said um, their, their kids like to be on YouTube all day, and, and one of their favorite channels to watch is this guy who goes around to the mall, and he just like gives away iPads, or he'll walk up to a total stranger and give them a, a Ferrari, or, or give them 
them a car, these expensive, lavish gifts, and he just gives them away. You know, it's the kind of the Oprah, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. It's like, it, I mean, it didn't mean anything, right? Like it didn't make a dent in your bank account, uh, you know, and, and and he said, son, you realize that that he's not actually giving any of those things away. Now, none of those things are his own possessions. Advertisers and people and corporations with big money are sponsoring him to give away these things so that he can make a profit off of people like you that watch his videos for doing, quote unquote, good things. Motive is it's the test of humility. And, and the reason I want to preach this message this morning is because I think in culture, we've, and especially in American culture, because we have a self-first centered culture. Everything you do at your job, at your work, is to be seen, is to be promoted in the educational system. It's to be valid Victorian. It's to come out on top, to be first, to be the quarterback, to be the first at whatever you do is the motivation of the world that, that you and I live in. And Jesus' message is the opposite. He says, no, actually, you shouldn't be last to be first. You should be last. And, and in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, he says this. He says, watch out. Do not do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing the trumpets in the synagogue and the streets, and they call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have already received their reward, the greatest that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. And something we have to know about humility is this, is that humility never seeks to gain. Humility never seeks to gain, and if there's any sort of motivation for personal pleasure or personal gain or some sort of return on investment, it's not actually humility because we gave out of the wrong intention, because we served out of the wrong intention. And Jesus says, look, you might get a reward, but what you receive is all that you'll get. Because it's the, the truly humble, it's the, the truly meek that will inherit my kingdom forever. And, and you can store up all of the, the worldly pleasures, and, and you can be first in the eyes of the world, but when you die, when you enter into eternity, it is the humble that will inherit my kingdom. It's those who took the, the lowest position. Humility, it never seeks to gain. Matthew 23, 11 through 12 says that the greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Again, we have to be careful that, that we're not reading this and going, all right, so Jesus, if I humble myself, you're going to make something of me. Jesus, if I, I humble myself, if I, I give my tithe faithfully, if I put $10 in so I can get those fireworks back, right? If I give to gain, Jesus, you're going you're gonna to see that. You're going to see my, my sacrifice and you're going to reward me. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're seeking it for the wrong reasons. When you come to me and you say, hey, look, did you see what I did? Jesus, did you, you see the gift that I put in the offering? Jesus, did you see the lady I helped across the street? Man, it was so inconvenient for me. I was leaving the grocery store and someone said, man, do you have jumper cables? My car doesn't start. And, and I did have jumper cables. And Jesus, you don't know the sacrifice that it was for me to take five minutes out of my day. And to get out my jumper cables and say, yeah, I guess you can use them. And then, and then I helped that man. Jesus, did you, did you see what I did? Jesus, do I get to be exalted now? Jesus, what is my reward 
for doing the things. And Jesus says, no, the, the rewards that you seek are not the rewards that I give. The reward I give to you is that you will be one with me in my kingdom forever. That if you want to be a servant of my kingdom, if you want to take a claim to a place of being my follower, of being my disciple, then you will be a person of true humility. You will be a person who serves. Don't be last to be first, be last. Mark 9, 33 through 35 says, after they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, I love this passage, they're, they're walking on this journey and they're discussing amongst themselves. And I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation, you don't think anyone else can hear you. And, and Jesus overhears their, their conversation. So knowing what they were talking about, he turns to them and he says, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer. Why? Because they were <laughs> embarrassed. They had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. He sat down and he called the 12 over to him. He said, hey, whoever wants to be first must take the last place and be the servant of everyone else. Man, which one of us is the greatest? And they're, they're stacking all of their, their talents, they're stacking their devotion, their commitment. Like, yeah, but you've only been G with Jesus for two weeks. I've been with him since day one. Did you know I was the first disciple that he called? Right? Did, do you know that, that I'm older than you? I, I've been memorizing the Torah longer than you. And they're, they're in this argument of, of who gets to be the greatest. And Jesus is like, what's even the point? The reality is you're not that great. I loved, I'm going to butcher it, but Steve said something a couple messages ago that I thought was great. He said it was the 20-40-60 the rule. He talked about in the 20s how you live, you work really hard, and you're doing everything to earn all this stuff so you can be great. And, and then in 40, you've kind of like reached your achievements. So you're talking about and you're living on the glory of look at what I've done. And then in 60, you realize no one actually cares about you and no one remembers your name. And uh, you realize you're not that important. And I think there's some truth to it is our, our motivation, our, our natural motivation is to be seen, to be on top, to be first. And Jesus says that's, that's not the way it'll be in my kingdom. Don't be last to be first, just be last. It's a, a cultural problem. It's a, a humanity problem. Um, we, we do things and we think because we do things, we're somehow greater than the person to the left or the right of us because of the house that we own or because of the amount of kids that we've raised or, hey, my kids still go to church. What happened to your kids? Right. Like we have these levels uh, of how I'm, I'm better than than the other person. A and we're continually stuck in this comparison trap of of, yeah, but I'm, I'm worthy of, of something because of all that I've accomplished. And we all measure it by different things. Some of us measure it by celebrity status. It reminds me of a story. Um, some of you guys um, are familiar with the show Cake Boss. It's an old show now. I don't think they make new episodes. If you haven't watched it, you really should go watch it. Um, guys, crazy talented. I've never seen cakes like this. I mean, they're like the size of my body cakes. And they're beautifully sculpted. He's amazing at what he does. People pay like $20,000 for a cake. It's crazy. Um, so uh, the guy's name is Buddy. He owns a cake shop. And uh, he, he makes all this stuff. Well, um, in the news, uh, this happened about eight years ago, but I just always remember it. Um, celebrities have their way of finding themselves in the news and in the headlines. And, um, and so he found himself in the headlines, not for his brightest moment, um, but he was pulled over and arrested on a DUI charge. And they, they breathalyzed him, checked his toxicity levels, and then took him away. And uh, as they were trying to take him away, he said, you can't do this. I'm the cake boss. I didn't get enough laughs as I should have. You can't do this. I'm the cake boss. Do you know who? I have my own TV show. Like, everybody knows me. Like, apparently you don't. But, but everybody knows me. I'm somebody. I'm something. And aren't I above this? What is my reward to gain for the fact that I'm so special? Nothing. Right? Because 
he used his position for gain and not out of humility. Philippians 2, 6, if, if anyone has the right to brag, it's the creator of the universe. It's the one who spoke everything into existence, the one who everything belongs to in the first place. And this is what it tells us about Jesus in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Now you got to pause for a second. I mean, if you had any inch of, of status to the level of what we would in modern day consider high power, you know, president of the United States, um, you know, billionaire owner of Tesla, like whatever it is that, you know, you'd look in culture and say, man, these people, you know, if anyone's going to try to use their leverage, like it's these people, right? And if we were in the same position, would you not at any point be like, well, I mean, right? Uh, story I didn't put in here, but um, uh, I was in my Bible study, and we were talking about a similar conversation. And um, my friend Rousseau, he's a pastor down at the story, he's a children's pastor down there. And he said he interacted with this lady who immigrated over from Russia. And uh, he was in this conversation with her and, and what her favorite thing about the United States of America is. And she said, my favorite thing is the DMV. She said, because at the DMV, everyone's treated as an equal. There's no bribes. No one cuts their way to the front. You get a number and you work through the line. Isn't that crazy? Because where she comes, people can pay their way to be the first. People can use their status. People can bribe their way into. But she said, at the DMV, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you come from, where you live, you get a number and you stand in line. And, and in many ways, Jesus is saying, this is, this is my kingdom. There, there's no status in my kingdom. This argument over who's going to be the greatest, just it's not even worth the argument. Like, you're all the same. Well, Jesus, that doesn't feel very special. Like, my mom told me I was special growing up, you know? Like, when do I get to cash in on that? And he's like, no. No, look, I, I see all of you with the intrinsic value that I see everybody because I made you and you're my creation. And, and look, if you want to be first, you need to be last. And if you're last, it's the humble who will inherit the earth. And, and so motive is the test of humility. Though he was God, he didn't think of equality as something to cling to. Nowhere do you see Jesus in Scripture saying, yeah, but I'm God. It, like the moment before he's hung on a cross and he could have said, yeah, but do you know who I am? In fact, the devil comes and tries to tempt him. And, and he says, why don't you just throw yourself off this building because you're the greatest jewel of heaven and the angels will catch you. And he says, but the scriptures say, though he was God, he, he didn't cling to his divine privilege. Instead, it says he gave them up and he took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and at his name, the name above all other names. Motive is the, the test of humility. And what Jesus' motive in Philippians 2, 6 through 11 is we look at this and what could Jesus have possibly gained. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. And tell me what there is to gain in that equation. For a, a group of people that, that don't deserve anything, for a group of people that are, are going to turn and use the great gift that you've created for them and they're, they're not even going to accept it. Jesus, what is there to gain in this equation the answer is, is nothing. Jesus didn't serve for any gain of himself. Jesus didn't do things out of obedience to gain position or authority. He gave up his authority. He gave up his position. He humbled himself. And in this, God exalted him and gave him the name that's above every other name. It's why we worship. It's what we sang about this morning in that song, Jesus, the name above every other name. If any name is going to be 
exalted. Let it be the name of Jesus. Humility is serving even when we realize there's nothing to gain. Humility is serving even when we realize there's nothing to gain. How many times do we evaluate the outcome of something? And we go, well, if it pays off in the end, then maybe it's it's worth it. I, I learned this um, mowing lawns growing up. I used to just mow the lawn, and then there's the shreds of grass on the side, and uh, and then I'd get up and go. And my dad taught me, no, you need to go the extra mile, and you need to either use the leaf blower, you need to get out there, and you need to sweep up the mess that you made. See, I was in it for a quick 10 bucks. And, and when he told me, hey, if you go the extra mile, I learned that people sometimes tip you. And then I always wanted to go the extra mile. I said, man, what else can I do to earn the extra $5 on top? The cherry, right? My motivation became the gain. Uh, I didn't do the extra because I loved and cared and wanted to serve the people. Uh, I did it because I, I thought in the end I might receive something in return. And this is the way we operate in our flesh. We operate out of gain. But Jesus' example of humility is that we serve when we realize there is nothing to gain. And he gives us this great example, and it's a pretty big passage of Scripture. So if you want to turn there in in John chapter 13. And and the reason I'd ask you to turn there is because I'm going to jump to another portion of the chapter And um, we're not going to read through the whole chapter, but I want you to see there's a a progression of what Jesus is communicating and and how this one section leads into the other section. And so in John 13, 4 through 17, it says, So he got up from the table and he took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not understand what I am doing, but someday you will. Peter protested, no, you will never wash my feet. Right, Jesus, you're too great a person to do something so lowly. You will never do this sin. And he protests, and Jesus said, look, unless I wash your feet, you won't belong to me. So Simon Peter explained, then wash my hands and my head as well, not just my feet. And I don't know if you read this the same way I read this. And I'm just going to precursor it by saying this is my, my opinion of reading into it a little bit. So don't take it as doctrine. But Jesus says, hey, look, un- unless... I wash your feet, you won't belong to me. So he says, well, wash all of me. Wash my arm, wash my hair, you know, head to my toe, scrub in the tub, right? Like, Jesus, do the whole thing. And you think about the picture of the story, who else is around? The other 12 disciples. Do we read about any of them jumping forward? Jesus, wash us, wash every part of us. Jesus says, no, unless I I wash your feet, immediately his response is, well, give me more. Make me stand out from the rest. I I don't want just the the one thing you're going to do. I want the extra on top. And again, I'm totally reading into it. But could it be his motive is to gloat to the other disciples? (laughs) Well, you know, Jesus only washed your feet, but uh, hey, he washed my head the back of my ears, he got the Q-tips out, right? I'm pretty special because Jesus washed all of me, but he only washed part of you. Uh, There's a home video I have growing up, and three of us are in the bathtub together. My sister, I'm the middle, and then I have a younger brother. And uh, because I'm the middle child, I get picked on a lot, and my my siblings love when I preach on this. Um, Maybe it's so I can make myself feel better. So uh, (laughs) the opposite of what I'm preaching, right? She turns to me in the bathtub and she goes, Jacob's eight and a half months. You're just two. Like, what kind of brag was that? I don't know, right? There's this this motive. Peter's like, hey, wash all of me. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus says, look, a person who's been bathed all over does not need to wash except for his feet. 
Jesus is saying, look, you, you're making a ridiculous command. You're already clean. You don't need to be washed all over. What's, what's the point? Why are you asking for this? He says, you are my disciples are clean. And then, ooh, but not all of you. For Jesus knew the one who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. But after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and he asked them, do you understand what I was doing? See, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Jesus says this is the the example that, that I've set in place before you. And, and if you follow the progression of, of John chapter 13, we get to this, this famous passage that many of us know in John 13, 34 through 35. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other and your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And if you follow the progression, Jesus says, hey, love as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love? It, we see that Jesus, he, he humbled himself. He, he gave up the authority. He gave up the privilege, and he took the lowest place among the group. Not for anything that he could gain. Not for anything in return. Jesus loved from a, a place of humility, and, and motive will test our humility. See, when we, we love for something in return, when we do good things as a church, you know, we're out in the community doing snow cones. And let me tell you, our heart and our motive is simply to say, hey, we're here and we love you and we care about you. And we posted some pictures, but you know what? It's not about us. Our, our motive for serving the community, our motive for doing good things it is not so that we can brand ourselves as the greatest church community in town. Uh, our motive is to serve Jesus and to love as Jesus loved, to give without anything in return. It was amazing how many people uh, would say, man, you, you're doing this for free? We said, yeah, we're, we're just giving them out. Well, do you want anything? No, like that's not really why we're doing it. Well, here, take $2 anyways, because people don't understand in our culture how to receive a free gift. They don't understand why someone would do something without trying to gain something in return. But wait, you mean I can have this and you're not going to make me come to your church on Sunday morning? No, that's not really our motive. But if you want to, by all means, we'd love to have you, right? But no, it's not like, hey, fill out your name and address and we're going to send you a whole bunch of stuff in the mail. We're going to tell you all the things you're doing wrong and you need to repent or turn or burn, right? Just sign up, repent, then you can come be a part of us. So this is not our, our message. Our message is we want to love like Jesus loved. We want to serve like Jesus served. We don't serve for the sake of gain. We, we serve for the sake of Christ's name and his glory. And, and our mission here at Path Church is to connect people with the path of Jesus yeah, it's not to connect them to ourselves or to our events or to the name of what we're doing or to any other motivation you can connect to it. Our, our motive, our heart is that Jesus would be made great, that Jesus would be known, Jesus would be exalted above all things. Why? Because Christ has exalted him. God has exalted Christ to be the name above every other name. Jesus says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And this is my problem is how many times, not that we do it intentionally, but if we're honest, we've all done it. We, we try to cash in on our humility. And, and we say, Jesus, but look at all the years of, of Sunday school I've done. Jesus, look at all the, the years of Bible verses I've memorized. 
Jesus, look how I, I sacrificed for my children or how I, I gave money to that person when I really didn't have money to give. And Jesus, does it count for anything? I mean, now I'm going through this great loss. Jesus, do you see what I'm going through? Is this what you, you treat people that commit themselves wholeheartedly to you? Right? Well, we just shared a message a couple weeks ago on, on suffering, that Jesus didn't come to give us this cushy, comfortable life. Paul says, you know how many times I've been beaten? How many times I've been flogged? How many times I've suffered for your name? <laughs> what did Paul have to gain? Nothing. He said, look, I consider everything else garbage. My life doesn't matter. My life has been thrown away. It exists for the gain of Christ and for his message. I, I don't care about the humiliation. Uh, I don't care about the divide in the culture that people are going to reject me for the sake of my message. Uh, I, I've become all things to all people that I might win some. Well, we see the, the message of the gospel, the humility. And um, I, where I want to end is, is with this, this story. We were at a conference and um, uh, this isn't the, the message on tongues today, so um, we're, we're going to do a series on the Holy Spirit eventually and really talk about that. So if I create any confusion here, uh, I'll clear it up in a future sermon another time. But uh, we are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that, that God gifts to people a heavenly prayer language. Um, and sometimes uh, in other languages, earthly languages, we believe in gifts of prophecy and of healing and... Um, I was at a conference with a, a room full of church leaders, and there was a, a particular pastor in the room that during the worship service, he felt he had a message from the Lord to deliver in tongues. And so he interrupted the pastor in the middle of speaking, and he said, I have a, a message, and um, if any of you do this to me, I will do the same thing to you. Uh, he said, um, we're kind of in the middle of something right now. So he said, if you still have the message, when I'm done preaching, he said, then you can give the message, right? And some of you guys are like, oh, wow, you can't do that. Well, like, it's order. Paul has a whole passage in Corinthians about order, right? It's not, no, you can't use the gift. You can't look. If God's giving you this message, it's not going to go away. It can wait. So he preached the message. He gets to the end of the service, and he says, brother, do you still have this message? He said, yes, I have this message. So he comes forward. He utters this message in tongues, and some of you guys have experienced this before. And so, um, ultimately, if it's not done properly, all it really does is create confusion. And we know that the Holy Spirit doesn't cause and create confusion. I and so, biblically, when there's a message in tongues, you call for an interpretation. And so, um, so he communicates this message. And, of course, the majority of us in the room are like, I have no idea what just happened. And... Um, so pastor gets up and he says, hey, you know, biblically, we call for an interpretation. So he said, here's what we're going to do. We're not in a rush. And he said, we're going to wait, and uh, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to bring an interpretation to this. And um, so we're all waiting, and there's silence in the room, and you know, eventually someone speaks out. And um, I, I don't know, maybe you've been in an experience, but so many times people just quote Old Testament prophecy. And um, so, you know, thus saith the Lord, and, you know, this guy stands up, he starts saying all this stuff, and um, to no judgment on him or in the room, but everyone was just like, eh. So another guy stood up, and he gives this message. Five different people stood up and gave a message, and because it's the way the Holy Spirit works, you know when, when the Spirit moves. You know when that, that Spirit falls. And, and there was just this awkward sense in the room. No one moderated it. It's not like the guy up front was like, hey, that's not the message. Uh, who's next? No, sorry, that's not the message. No one did that. It was just this unifying Spirit across the room. And, and we all sat there, and we went, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's it. And a whole bunch of pastors getting up, speaking. Eventually, this lady stands up. She says, hey, this is really embarrassing for me. She said, I'm not a pastor. Um, I'm here as a delegate voter. I'm just an average lay person. Um, but she said, I, I feel like God wants me to share this. Uh, I would never do this. I'm terrified of the microphone, but I, I just feel like God really wants me to communicate this. So she gets up and she says, look, uh, it wasn't in fancy words. And I believe this is the way the spirit moves. 
does his, his own thing. And sometimes we try to put him into a box and make him do the thing the way we want to do the thing. This totally average person stands up. She says, our, my husband and I, we own this property. And she said, what we do is we do wedding events. And um, we bought this property. When we bought it, it was trash. Like, no one wanted to look at the property. It was an eyesore to the community. She said, look, we've spent 15 years developing this property and making it beautiful so that we can put on all these events. And um, she said, then uh, recently, we just felt led of God that, you know, it's time for us to move on. We need to sell this property, and it's not ours anymore. And she said, I'm out there. I'm on my mower. And she said, I'm mowing the lawn one day. And um, she says, kind of, I don't know where your Holy Spirit time is. She said, that's my time. I just, I have music in my ears. She said, I just spend my time out on the lawn mower praying to Jesus. And um, I was just there. She said, I was so angry and I was frustrated. And I said, God, it's not fair. We've spent 15 years developing this property, putting the work into it, tilling the soil, working the land. And now someone else is going to purchase this property and benefit all the hard work of our labor. And, and she said the spirit communicated to her, yeah, kind of like I did for you. <laughs> right? Across the whole place, thus saith the Lord, quotation from Ezekiel, quotation from Jeremiah. No. Hmm. Kind of like I did for you. And it was evident across the place. Our spirits just went, man, that was the word from the Lord. See, Jesus didn't serve for any gain. What could he gain from the gift that he gave us? He, he didn't serve for his own self. He gave up his divine privileges. None of us can work hard enough, can do enough to earn the gift that he's given us. Jesus says, yeah, look, I, I did all this work simply for you and someone else you are the the beneficiary of christ's work on the cross and you didn't do anything to earn it you don't have any status to to cash in on and say but christ look at my my works no christ did for you and for me what we couldn't do for ourselves and he didn't do it for the sake of his own gain but he did it for you and for me because he took the place of a a humble servant and he said, look, to be my disciple, to be my servant, you don't take last place for the motivation that one day you can be first place and make something great of yourself. Be last to be last. Be last because I made myself nothing for the gain of all of humanity. If you want to be my disciple, this is, is the message. This is the communication is, look, you, you serve with humble motivation Humility is, is communicated through our motivations, and, and humility without the right motivation is simply pride in disguise. When we serve for gain. That's not humility. That's, that's pride. How many times have we, we tried to cash in on our humility? And, and the, the question in response to defeat this is really what can you give to God or what have you done for God that makes you worthy of any praise what have I done that makes Christ worthy of anything is not everything already his does he not already own everything is everything that I give to him simply giving back what was already his to begin with he, he's the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills Right? He's the one that spoke into existence. He's the one that, that puts his mark on us. It's his work that claims us. And, and who are we to say that we should be first in front of anyone else when Jesus has called us to be last? He says, this is how the, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love doesn't serve for selfish gain. And the reality is, you're not that important. I'm not that important. None of us are going to get to heaven and say, Jesus, like, man, that guy next to me, Raymond, I mean, he was all right. But I was a pastor. Went to Bible school. Had like, I don't know, 40 people in my church last Sunday. Like, 
I mean, if anyone's worthy of that little jewel up there, right? Jesus is like, no, that's not the way my kingdom works. The, the last will be first, be last to be last, because it's the example that Christ gave us. I want to end with this verse. Matthew 5.5, 5, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. And I, as we pray, I want you to lean into this, this application, being that Jesus is the one that set the example before us. I want you to answer this question for yourself as we pray. So what does it mean to be last? Jesus said, I, I've given you an example to follow, and you will be blessed for, for doing. So what is the example Christ laid before us and what it means to be last? And what does that mean for you and for me as followers of Jesus today? Let's pray this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it instructs us it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, I, I know that all of us, sin at its root is pride. Any sin that we've committed is, is to say that, God, we, we take the first place above you. We place ourselves on the throne. And so there's not a single person in this room today that can communicate that they have achieved the status of humility. Christ, we're, we're all sinners. We're all in need of this example of humility that you laid before us. God, I pray for Path Church this morning. I pray for those watching online. I pray for us here today that we would take to heart these words, this example that you set before us, that, that it's truly those who take the last place that will be exalted. Exaltation is simply for your glory. Exaltation is the inheritance of, of your eternal kingdom. It's not earthly reward or status or anything we have to gain. Paul said, I have given it all up. It's all foolishness in light of the cross. Christ, would you humble us today in our own sin, in our own confession. Jesus, would you humble me? God, that I would recognize who I am before you and that I would recognize the example that you've called me to live. God, it's that by the, the sacrificial, not serving to gain, love on display that would communicate to the world that we belong to you. Jesus, forgive us of the times that we've thought ourselves better than any person to the right or the left of us, that we've judged outside of these walls people who have made certain decisions and think somehow we are holier than them when our sin separates us just the same. Christ, it is it's your work the, the humbleness that you laid yourself down on the cross with nothing to gain for the sake of our gain, for the sake of us. And God, we've received that gift. We walk in your salvation. You've called us to serve, to love, so that others would know the glory of who you are, that your glory, your gift of salvation, your work on the cross would be on display through us, that other people would be drawn to who you are. So Christ, we make nothing of ourselves today. We humble ourselves that you would be exalted in this place. In your name we pray. Amen.